We feel tremendously privileged this morning to have two guests with us, Mana missionaries to Guatemala and two folks that are helping specifically in, in a number of feeding centers, a number of local churches, uh, but they are actually working weekly in El Dorado, Guatemala. Um, very recently, most of you know this, we started with just a patch of empty land and that building has been coming up and coming up and progressing. And at our last mission trip, we were able to take a great group of folks from Calvary and go down and paint and work there in the building. It's come along even further now. And, and I'll never forget, I think maybe my most vivid memory from one of these Guatemala trips, we try to take two a year, was being in the second story balcony of the hotel where we were staying and we had it all to ourselves and 20 of us down on our knees with the pouring rain outside and, and right there with the roar of that rain praying, oh God, send the pastor for this work in El Dorado. Lord, more than any building, more than any feeding center, this is going to need your man and woman to lead this church for the glory of God. And God sent that pastor, Jairo Mendez, and uh, Brother Dick Bass and his sweet wife Barbie have been there with Jairo and his dear wife. Uh, they've already gotten to see him winning people to Christ. They're going to come this morning. They're all the way from Guatemala. They're here, Dick and Barbie Bass, man, man of missionaries to Guatemala. They're going to come give us a little update on what's going on in El Dorado and what's going on with Pastor Mendez. Give them a big hand as they come, if you would. doing fine they put the pictures out here and I'm all messed up preacher oh my gosh I'm so homesick we've been gone five days can't take it <laughs> we're really 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 here to for two reasons this morning and I'll be very brief and honest uh, Frank if I may we're here first to thank you for what for your part for doing your part above and beyond what we might consider the call to make sure the gospel gets to Guatemala, specifically to El Dorado, Sampango, Guatemala. And, and, and the second is to make an impassioned appeal, not let up. We're committed, and we're here to promise you, we're there, we're on the field, every day and we won't let up or give up or shut up you remember that one i'm sure till they've all heard the gospel till we've had the opportunity i know that we have some photos this is three hours and 15 minutes from here by airplane and 30 minutes by car and you're in El Dorado, Guatemala. I was listening to the songs you sang this morning, songs of joy and songs of hope and songs of promise, a redeemer, a helper. Those are exciting things. Hope, someone who will protect us, someone who's with us every day. I want to tell you that three hours and 15 minutes 30 minutes by car is a village of 19 to 25,000 people who've never heard the name of Jesus Christ. Believe it or not, they have no televisions. They couldn't have watched being heard or whatever on TV. They have no radios. Very few of these houses have electricity nor water. We ate out the other night at a steakhouse. I love Texas steak. 
I hadn't seen a steak in two years. And it was amazing. And as I begin to consume that steak I, and enjoy my fellowship with my sweet wife here in, in the States, the guy brought me a little slip of paper. And the number on the bottom of that slip of paper equals what our families live on each week. And I felt so guilty that I would consume a meal, one meal that would cost what a family of eight would eat on in Guatemala. I think it's a good guilt. I'm not apologize for it. And I don't want you to have it unless the Lord gives it to you too. There in that village, there is no hope. There was no hope. There was no future. There was no promise until the Lord sent Jairo Mendez, Jairo and Mali, and their two children. And preacher, guess what? We were having dinner with them the other night. I said, Molly, would you like some dessert? She said, oh, yes, how about you, Hiro? No, I'm full. She got her a big dessert. She started going after it. And he said, you know why she's so hungry? No, why? She's eating for two. <laughs> so our pastor and Molly are going to have a baby in when? April. In April. So uh, life is like life, only a little differently. We went into the village. We met Molly and, and Hiro at a seminary in Chamaltenango. Molly and Jairo met at Bible College. So all of you should enroll in Bible College. <laughs> Whether you get your BA or BS, doesn't matter, just ladies, get your MRS and then worry about your graduation, right? Marry you a good guy like Jairo Mendez. Precious couple, graduated together after a few weeks of discussion and praying and crying and talking and, and uh, uh, Jairo agreed to be our pastor in El Dorado. And we went down there for the first time and we went in the village and the guy just walked right up to the first person he saw, introduced himself, loved on him for a few minutes. These are people with no hope, no Bible. They've never heard the gospel ever, ever. Do you, I know that don't, didn't sink in for me for a long time. And he very carefully and gently presented the gospel. In a few moments, we're all praying this person accepts Christ as Savior. And from that moment on, it was just through the village, door to door, visiting. Door. Well, you, you don't knock on the doors. You don't knock on the doors. Compromiso, Senor. Compromiso, may I come in, Senora? May I, may I come in? They don't have doors. And I watched as Hiro systematically presented the hope of Jesus Christ to a group who have no hope. Boy, if I could encourage you to do anything, just stay home one meal this month and give it to the missions fund. Catch up that 2,000, put another two in there. Not for my sake, not for the pastor's sake, not for the sake of this Calvary Baptist Church I love, for the sake of the gospel. Let's stay focused. Hiro, the, about the second week we're there. How am I doing? I'm about to run out of time. About the second week we were there, we go into the village, and Hiro says, uh, you know, in Spanish, he doesn't speak any English. Hiro says, I just heard someone died in the village. A little lady who had heart, heart trouble in her 30s, going to the doctor. He said, yeah, we can fix it, but you got to come back in a week or two when we have medicine. She didn't go back because she felt better. And then when she did go back, they said they couldn't help her. And she passed away from something that you, you could get treated here just like that. So we went to the house for the funeral. There in that little bitty shack, there's a casket. Yeah, give us another photo. Yeah, that's Hiro. And his, there in that little house is a casket. And it's open and the body's in there. And, and Hiro standing on the other side of the casket and the family's here and he says, now, this person has made their decision. But you have time to make yours. Jesus died for you and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. For most people, it's the first time they've ever heard that good news. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father except by me. 
very gently presented. And Pastor, while I'm standing there watching Hiro present the gospel over this casket with his family weeping, I'm looking out the window at a Mayan idol as the people stream by one at a time at the funeral to worship a God they don't know. A God that hasn't helped them and isn't going to help them. And we left there and went down to the church building in El Dorado that you guys have built. Guys, awesome. Went down there, cranked up the music. The kids showed up out of nowhere. In a minute, we have 250, 300 children in there who six, eight months ago were quiet and reserved and, and afraid and sad. And now they're dancing around in the room and they're clapping their hands. And we taught them how to sing, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Now, that shows you how far away they are, for heaven's sakes. Woody Cash taught me that in Bible college. <laughs> what a precious thing to see these children as Hyrule presented the gospel in this vacation Bible school and children begin to raise their hands and pray the prayer. This is one of, uh, I'm sorry about the photos, they're not the greatest, I'll send some good ones. But here they are, these kids, we're teaching them how to, how to be loved for the first time. Teach them how to love and how to share that love in their community. You are community changers. You may not realize it, but there's a community about four hours from here that'll never be the same. And it's because of your love for Jesus Christ and your willingness to share. Let me just go through the pictures. This is one of the vacations. When we get back, we got a two-day vacation. You Come on down. We had a two-day vacation Bible school Monday and Tuesday. We're expecting about 400. This is one of the vacation Bible schools that, that we did. Look at in the building, gorgeous. Let's have another picture. We'll do this real quickly. Yep, in a minute. That's where the, they came forward to be saved. We probably had 40, Pastor. I didn't count them all. But Hiro's got a little pad and paper. He keeps track. And there is another book. And there he is teaching the children. He is so gentle and kind. And his wife... They are just precious with the children. Look at the windows. You see the nice windows now? They have glass. We have doors. We're one of the few churches in Guatemala that has doors. I mean, we're uptown. And because of your love, Barbie and I are there. I wish, you could, uh, I, wish I could express from the depth of my heart how thankful I am that God has allowed us to take this last part of our lives, the fourth quarter of our lives. I, I'm not fond of those kind of statements, by the way. I don't feel old. 69. I know you're wondering, so I'll go ahead and say it. But I'm thankful that God allowed us, but you do realize we're only there by the grace of God and by your willingness to keep us there. And I'm so thankful for you. We pray for you. We pray for your pastor's wife. I mean, pastor every day. But we do pray for the Calvary Church and, and what a tremendous thing you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless. Update. We're so proud to be partnering with you guys. Luke chapter 12. I do know what time it is. My watch is very functional. And by the way, we will be taking, God willing, a trip down in January, a very special trip, to dedicate that building, and then two more trips in 2015 that you can still get in on and I tell you the folks that are most moved by what they just saw are the ones that have stood there and worked there and met those people and we would love to take you too. Uh, we'll be giving you all the information you need but you can ask today back at the Welcome Center about that and we'd love to get you over there. Luke chapter 12 last week 
I, uh, I got to look on, and one of my favorite parts of Judgment House, frankly, is, is when I kind of step away from the counseling room, and, and Lauren was so good to come and fill in for me, uh, but Terry and I are usually in there, then Lauren and my mom will come in and take over, and, and I'll kind of make the circuit and go around and just try to encourage each scene a little bit, say a prayer with them, uh, tell them what's going on and who's being saved, and, and hopefully just kind of keep their spirits up, because listen... Scene after scene after scene after scene after scene after scene, saying these same lines, acting the same part, doing the same thing. I'm always amazed to see the volunteers in the hell scene. Because listen, these individuals are the green berets of Judgment House, okay? They have signed up for something that is above and beyond because in that room, it is dark, it's hot, it smells, it's oppressive, and yet, scene after scene after scene, they're in there screaming themselves hoarse, acting out this scene to try to get anywhere close to giving people a glimpse of how terrible that place will be. I got to look on as a pastor in the heaven scene as eight-year-olds and 80-year-olds sat in there alongside one another and everything in between with their arms raised, praising Jesus, singing, Worthy is the Lamb, 957 times. Why group after group went through. I saw my son Vance on, on the last scene one night. His hands had gone from here to here. And he was, he was staring through Jesus. I'll just tell you that, just looking right through him. I saw my friend Daniel Bezorgny a time after time after time after time go by and put his hands on people's shoulder and just say that little phrase of encouragement that had people in tears for both weekends. I got to look on as security teams, tour guides, food service, and, and folks I neglected to mention, the prayer walkers who prayed all night long for every single scene. I got to watch all of those individuals slogging through the rain one night when we were terrified. We actually prayed. I say we prayed. I never prayed this prayer uh, because I'm from West Texas. I feel I could never ask God not to send rain, okay? But I know some of you were like, Lord, help and, and I had the sentiment, God, please hold off the rain so people will come. You know what God answered our prayer as he's prone to do a little differently than we asked it? He sent the rain, and he still sent all the people. And we had one of our most crowded nights as our folks just slogged through the rain all night long. And by the way, um, Candace Chapman and, and uh, oh, good night, Jeanette Cook, and our Ron Adams, such a great job heading this thing up. Uh, Ron in particular, and, and Charles Hill, those guys in leadership did such a magnificent job. And I want to I say especially to Ron. Where's Ron this morning? He may be helping out in Kid City. Can we give him a big hand for all his work? But watching these folks over two weekends, just giving time, effort, tears... The question I want to pose in our very short time together this morning is, why? Why would they do that? It certainly wasn't for their comfort. There were far more comfortable scenarios for them those two weekends. Certainly wasn't because they didn't have something else to do. Everybody could have stayed home and watched the game, watched television, headed out to the movies, just had some leisure time. Wasn't because they enjoyed every aspect of it. I can guarantee you, nobody enjoys every aspect of the thing. Why would they do it? And I want to take that question out a little bit. Why, why, why would Dick and Barbie Bass, after 30 years of pastoring a church, ministering in the United States, at the age when, when hey, they kind of should be looking at retirement, and, hey, we've, we've ministered, man. I mean, we've done what God called us to do. Now we get to kick back and be ministered to a little bit. Why, why in the world would they leave America, move to Guatemala, and serve people who are in abject poverty and need? Why? Why would some of you, you know what, our church pledged a year ago $5,300 a month 
toward Mission El Dorado. And you know what? Our church has kept that commitment. Why in the world? We don't have a wealthy church. There's a lot of folks in this church with debt, with kids, with hobbies, with a million places they could use that money. And some are giving, listen to me, some are giving way above and beyond what they could ever afford on paper. I guarantee you that. Why would they do it? Jesus tells us why people do it and they should do it. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. Look at this. Luke 12, 15. And Jesus said unto them, unto a crowd of people gathered around him as they were so prone to be, take heed and beware of covetousness. The modern word for that is materialism. Take heed and beware of materialism, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. I want you to get this, because this is profound. The creator of life is telling us how life works, or rather how it doesn't work. A man's life, be careful, be aware, because listen, materialism won't give you life. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. In other words, life. By life we mean joy, meaning, beauty, depth, vitality. Jesus says you're not going to get that in possessions and earthly pleasures. By the way, when Jesus said that, he is speaking direct in direct contradiction to what those people felt intuitively and to everything that America in 2015 preaches. America in 2015 tells you, if you can just get enough money, if you can just get enough fame, if you can just make it to retirement, if you can just build up your 401k, if you can just marry the right person, have the right hobbies, get the right safety nets, have your children thrive, drive the right car, and attend the right college, you can have joy, vitality, beauty. And the creator of life says, no, you can't. Life doesn't work that way. And then he launches into one of the most gorgeous descriptions of where you will truly find life in the entire Bible. Look at Luke 12, 22. And Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought, don't worry for your life, what you shall eat, neither for your body what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, The body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have a storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much are you better than the birds? And which of you, with taking thought, worrying, can add to his stature one cubit? A cubit is a unit of measurement. It's about a foot and a half. Which of you, by fretting and worrying, can grow physically? If you then uh, be not able to do that thing which is least, why are you worried about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow, they toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you, Solomon in all his glory wasn't arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what you shall eat or what you shall drink, neither be ye of a doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. In other words, the world is so anxious about their money and their possessions and the Joneses next door and whether I'm keeping up properly and whether people think I'm successful and whether people think well of me. Jesus says, listen, they're all fretting about that because they've banked their life on that stuff. Jesus said, don't be like them. After all these things do the nations of the world seek after, your Father knows 
You have need of these things. He knows you need money. He knows you need clothes. He knows you need a car. He knows you need a home. He knows you need a vacation. Can I get an amen? I need a vacation, right? Some of you are thinking that. But rather, I know you need that stuff, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God. Put your focus on that. And all these things, the money you need, the car you need, the clothes you need, the vacation you need, the stuff, shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that you have your possessions and give alms or money to the poor. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be. I want to entitle our time together for these next few moments, The Why of Kingdom Living. Why give when you can keep? Why go when you can stay? Why serve when you can look for the world to serve you? Why join a church and put yourself out there for other people instead of having this consumeristic 2015 American church mindset, which is I will pick a church and I will stay at a church based on what you can give me and how well you perform that? Why? Would we give our lives away to Jesus and others? Jesus gives us three reasons why and the why of kingdom living. Briefly, number one, because only one God satisfies. Only one God satisfies. Jesus said in Luke 12, 34, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I tell you, I was shocked to find, the first time someone preached this and taught this, it absolutely blew my mind. I was just shocked and somewhat appalled by it. When this individual preaching a sermon asked the question, who or what is your God? And of course, our first reply is Jehovah God, Jesus Christ. He's my God. He's he's the one that I worship. Nothing else, no one else. But you know what, friends, listen to me. Your true God is whatever you orient your life around. We human beings are finite creatures. That means we have limited amount of time, limited money, limited energy. We cannot divest those resources unendingly, so we make decisions. I won't do this, so I can do this. I won't give money, time, or energy to these people or these causes. Instead, I'll sacrifice them to ascribe supreme value to this, to something or someone else. We invest our time, our money, our life in that which we see as most worthy, most rewarding, most glorious. We make those decisions every day. And listen, They're worship decisions. They show up in our day planner. They show up in our outlook calendar. They show up in our inbox. They show up in our budget. We are all about not doing some things so that we can do other things that we find more glorious. So, friend, i got to ask you and me an honest question. What is in the position of glory in your life? What person or thing is most important to you that they get your time, your energy, your affection, and your money. Because listen to me, functionally, that's your Savior. That's your God. And the creator of life tells us, listen, there are a lot of gods out there you can worship. There's only one that'll give you life. There's only one that'll satisfy. There's only one that can meet that gaping void in the center of our soul. Jesus said, here's why you should give, because only one God satisfies. Secondly, he said you should do it because only one kingdom survives. Look at verse 16. We've read this a lot of times, so I'm going to read it quickly, but it's so powerful. Jesus spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, 
And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. In other words, things are going well. And he said, this will I do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods, lay up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. In other words, i got to go get me some more storage because things are going well. And this is what life's all about. And I'm making plans for the future. Verse 20, but God said unto him, what? God who is closer than the air we breathe all the time, was neglected by this man, ignored by this man, passed by by this man, but make no mistake, God was there all the while. And God says, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward him. God. Notice, God doesn't call him wicked. He doesn't call him sinful for making his life all about pursuits and pleasures and homes and stuff and success. And You know what he calls him? A fool. You say, you're a fool. Because only one kingdom survives. Only one kingdom is going to make it out of here. I've shared this more times than I can count. I never read it without it just about putting the hairs on the back of my neck up. Sooner or later, I'm quoting, everything we own ends up in the junkyard. You ever think about that? Christmas and birthday presents, cars, boats, hot tubs, clothes, stereos, barbecues, the treasures children quarreled about, friendships were lost over, honesty was sacrificed for, and marriages broke up over, all end up in the junkyard. And God says, don't be a fool. You can build up possessions. Yes, you can. You can accumulate pleasurable experiences. Yes, you can. But God says, they will not outlast you. Come and give it to me, and it'll last for all eternity. I want to tell you something. You folks who've been on these El Dorado trips, you folks who gave beyond your means to make sure these people have a church and have food and have shoes and have life, every one of you that gave a pair of shoes, every one of you that bought a pair of shoes, I want you to know something. It won't end what you did when those shoes wear out. It'll never end because Jesus Christ took account of it. Why do we do it? Because only one God satisfies, only one kingdom survives, and finally, because only one investment saves. Only one investment saves. I love Luke 12, 33. Sell that you have your possessions. Does he mean all your possessions? He might. <laughs> the idea here is that you say, God, none of this is mine. All the clothes in that closet, they're yours. That home is yours. The bank account is yours. I'm just tending it for you. But God, everything I've got and everything I am is yours. You say the word and tell me what to do with it, and it's done. He might ask you for everything. Most of the time, it's been my experience that God knows you need a good functional vehicle. He knows you need a good safe home. He knows you need health care. He knows you need a vacation. In my experience, most of the time, God can give you that stuff better than you would have ever dreamed of. But sell that you have your possessions, whatever God tells you to do, and give money to the poor. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moss corrupt. Luke 12, 31, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. What is he saying? He's saying make sure you don't waste the resources God has given you. Invest them in the kingdom. Invest them in eternity. Invest them in people getting saved and lives getting changed. Invest them in feeding the hungry. Invest them in clothing the naked. Invest them in making somebody else's life better. And listen, it won't end with you. It will last into eternity. Friend, what a thought that you're buying a child a pair of shoes might be part of the catalyst 
for them hearing the gospel and becoming a born-again follower of Jesus Christ. Isn't that an insane thought? That me giving a few dollars, that me taking a mission trip, that me speaking a kind word, that me loving on somebody like the Basses and helping them get to the field might change somebody's eternal destiny. Those last two weekends, I'm telling you, I'm your classic overthinker. How many overthinkers we got in the house? Anybody like that? You think way too much. Your biggest problem is right here. God bless you. I love you, man. Me too. Me too. We always want to make the gospel harder than it is. We always want to see some kind of works go with it. Let's make sure, let's make sure that you really want this and really, but you know what? Christ said, just look to me in your need. Just look to me in your lack. Just come to me in your sin. Like that brazen serpent raised on the pole in the, in the, the book of Exodus. Just look. And you watch what Jesus will do for you. Friend, listen to me. You just give. And I believe we will be shocked how Christ uses and multiplies every single gift. Jesus said a cup of cold water in his name would be rewarded. Why do we give financially, physically? Why do we serve? Why do we go? Why do we send? Because it is the greatest work in the universe. Let's all stand. Our musicians are coming this morning. We love to conclude every service with just a little bit of time where we get quiet and the music plays. And we have a moment where we get silent before our God. You might be here today and the truth is there's some stuff going on in your life that's so incredibly painful. And listen, pain is like this screaming noise in your life. And sometimes it drowns out even the voice of God. You know what? Maybe you're here this morning and you felt that gentle pull of the Spirit. Maybe you're here and you didn't feel a thing. Can I tell you something? Listen, just because the clouds have rolled in doesn't mean the sun's not still shining behind them. He loves you. He's for you. He knows what you're going through. Maybe today you just need to take a big, deep breath and maybe cry a little. And just let him put his arms around you this morning. He'll do it. You let down that guard and let Jesus do what he does. You might be here this morning. The truth is, you and God have got a lot of distance between you because there's something you're hanging on to. Some of you, you may be mad, angry, bitter. Life hadn't gone like you wanted it to. So you put up a wall a long time ago. Friend, I want to tell you something. He loves you, wall and all. But you're hurting yourself. You're robbing yourself of the greatest gift, and that's Jesus. Maybe this morning you need to walk down and kneel at an altar and let it go. Let it go. Ask forgiveness. Put your hand in his. Trust him. Maybe you're here today, and the truth is these words sting because you know your life is increasingly wrapped up in little pleasures and little possessions and little pastimes, and your life is not invested in the work of Jesus Christ, and it's not invested in the work of blessing others. Some of you pledged but have never done. I want to tell you something, friend. Listen to me. God is going to keep on coming to you and drawing you out of a life like that because that life will break you down. There's no life in that. There's no vitality in that. He's got something bigger and better for you, but it's going to come in the strangest of ways. It's going to come in you giving yourself away. So here's the thing. Whatever the need, one of... 10,000 needs. If you need to come down and pray at an altar this morning, you come on down. If you need to pray right where you're seated, do that. We're just going to get real quiet 
And I want to tell you, if you're here this morning and you've been hearing about Jesus, but you don't know him, you're not sure if you're on your way to heaven, you're not sure if your sins have been dealt with, he's right here in the room today. He'll hear your prayer if you admit you're a sinner and ask Christ to be your Savior and give him you. If you need to talk to somebody about how that works, we'll be right here at the front. You come on down. Don't be shy. Don't let shy keep you. Don't let tentative keep you in a place where you're not free. You come this morning. All right? While we sing, I'm going to pray. We're going to sing. If you need to come for any reason, these altars are open. Let's just spend a little bit talking to God. Living God, very grateful for today. Take this invitation. Do whatever you want. I pray, Lord, you would continually help us to give and go. Lord, none of us do it like we could. None of us do it like we should. And this preacher sure included. Oh, God, give us that sense of how short our time is and the power of opportunities around us every moment. Make us aware of it this week. Bless this mission conference. Bless Colorado. Bless your church. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.